Hello, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for attending this session. I must start by reminding you of Ravenna's position, a key position on the northeast coast of Italy at a time when Venice did not exist. The shoreline of the northern Adriatic was a mass of lagoons and swamps with the odd tiny island settlement. But before the 8th century, there was no Venice. There were other important settlements at Aquileia and Grado, but the whole force of economic uh, concentration of the activity in this area was centered on Ravenna. This city was built on the same marshy islands of sandbanks separated by canals and waterways that formed in the river Delta. But it was also the gateway to Northern Italy and the Alps via the Valley of the Po. Milan about here, and then of course, Transalpine Europe. At Classis, it had the only secure large harbor on the Adriatic coast above Ancona. Ravenna is very well situated to command trade uh, from all parts of the Mediterranean into Northern Europe via the Valley of the Po. And at Classis, it had this harbour constructed on Julius Caesar's orders as a base for the Roman fleet serving the Eastern Mediterranean. It was also a highly strategic site, which is one reason why Emperor Honorius chose it for his capital in AD 402. I wanted to take on a, on a little walk around uh, Ravenna because it, it, you may know it very well. And if you do, I hope you don't mind coming around again. We're going to start here at the blue dot, which is the entrance to the main the main gate of the city, the Porta Aurea, uh, built by the Emperor Claudius in 43 AD. And we shall cross over among the rivers and go um, round to, to, to visit um, up through the, uh, over these bridges, over many canals to visit the uh, area of the northwest of the city where um, the Empress Galla Placidia built uh, we can go out of the city to in, uh, inspect the mausoleum of Theodoric up here. And we can come back in to see uh, the great church of San Giovanni Evangelista and then the palace area, much occupied by um, kings, ex emperors, kings, exarchs. And finally, we go back uh, to the northwest uh, to the site of San Vitale. So if we start outside the city, it, admiring the Golden Great Gate. Um, as I say, built in the first century AD and then uh, and much fortified in, mediev in the medieval period, but later destroyed and only some of the later of the classical decoration survives in the National Museum. But fortunately, um, Renaissance architects like Palladio had been to admire it and drew it. So we can see that it was a very splendid major entry to the city. Leaving, the, going through the city, uh, we, we, we will meant go on to the uh, area, area that Honorius uh, lived in. As the first emperor to move the whole imperial bureaucracy from Milan to Ravenna, Honorius decided to build a new capital. Very little, unfortunately, survives of his work, although he lived in the city for 20 years and probably built quite a lot. He did promote the, the Church of Ravenna and uh, over the head of the Church of Milan, but it's his half-sister, Gala Placidia, who left the most striking mark on the city. And we pr proceed to the area in the northwest where she, one of her first constructions seems to have been a large basilica church dedicated to the Holy Cross, which had at its west end a long narthex. You see it here. And at, at this end, the uh, south end, a chapel, which is now known as the mausoleum of Gala Placidia, although it was not designed as her mausoleum. It does have three massive sarcophagi in it. The church is now lost, but you see the, the, the 
surviving the, the modern church, or medieval church of Santa Croce uh, in the background here. This is the mausoleum of Gala Placidia, which would have been much taller in uh, its original state, but the ground level has risen so much that it now looks rather squat. Inside, we observe this absolutely glorious decoration of the starry sky, um, the uh, what, um, doves drinking at the fountain, deer at a, uh, at a well, uh, the apostles, and Saint Lawrence advancing towards his iron uh, grid on which he was martyred. This is the most striking monument of the period 425 to 450. I seem to have only one slide of the interior. I thought there were more, but let's look at it a little longer while I tell you about the area in which it's situated. In this northwest part of the city, the Empress had dominated the imperial administration in Ravenna for 13 years ruling in the name of her young son, Valentinian III. In 437, when he gained his majority, he went to Constantinople to marry Licinia Eudoxia, daughter of the emperor Theodosius II, and he brought her back to occupy the imperial palace. Their marriage united the two halves of the ruling dynasty, although Constantinople ruled by the senior emperor was undoubtedly superior in every way to Ravenna. Gala's genealogy was displayed in another of her foundations, the Basilica of San Giovanni Evangelista, which was almost completely destroyed by Allied bombing in 1944. Only the polygonal apses survive in their original state, which you see here. Fortunately, 18th century antiquarians had documented the interior decoration. And what they drew shows us that Gala Placidia was determined to display her, her family uh, back through several generations. Uh, in the roundels on the apse ar arch, she had images of Constantine the Great and her grandfather Valentinian II, thus combining the two imperial dynasties to which she belonged. Her father, Theodosius I, her uncle, Emperor Gratian, her second husband, Constantius, and her children were also represented in these roundels. Below, uh, in the apse, the bishop, uh, Peter Chrysologos, was shown officiating at the altar under this unprecedented display of imperial family propaganda. And this notion that the empress should demonstrate her connections, her very important descent antecedents, sets a pattern that proved very influential in Ravenna. We shall see it again in some other buildings. Many churches, or uh, were rebuilt uh, in more fashionable styles. And so we don't have their fifth and sixth century originals. And others, of course, simply disappeared. Secular buildings in particular were not well maintained. Honorius, Gala and Valentinian III all lived in grand palaces and built new palaces, but only fragmentary mos fl floor mosaics survive. And you see here some of the mosaics that are currently displayed. Um, this is one of, a, of a, a member of the circus faction driving his chariot called uh, Senorosus. Now Gala and most members of the secular elite were bilingual and she also knew Gothic. And Greek and well, as well as Latin inscriptions record the patronage of another church that dedicated to the apostles. In the crypt, you can see on the bottom left an inscription in Greek, which records uh, the donations made by Hezekius and Gemella, a couple who gave money for that part of the mosaic. 
In the middle, we have another um, uh, couple of uh, ded uh, dedications in Latin. Ravenna was also a center where Greek medical texts were translated into Latin and a Greek school of medicine survived into the late sixth century. The second phase of Ravenna's most famous history begins with the arrival of the Gothic King Theodoric at the end of a long march from the East. This brought a very distinct influence from Constantinople to the city as Theodoric had spent a critical decade of his youth, um, the 460s, in the capital as a hostage. There he had observed court ceremonial, watching the emperor, greeting guests, receiving diplomats and generals. And there he learned the value of efficient administration, tax collection and legal procedures. He might have recognized his father and uncle among those barbarians bringing tribute to their overlord uh, as displayed on the uh, bottom of the uh, obelisk of Theodosius in the Hippodrome in Constantinople. After this very important decade of his youth, he was sent back to his people, uh, hopefully, as, uh, as they thought in, in Constantinople, hopefully as an ally, someone who would introduce Roman customs and bring the people, uh, the Gothic tribes into closer relationship with Constantinople. Um, this was not done for many years. In 490, after negotiations with the Emperor Zeno, Theodoric assumed the right to lead his people from the East Mediterranean, right across the Balkans and over the Julian Alps into North Italy. Once he had defeated all opponents and occupied Ravenna, he set about developing the palace area into his own miniature version of Constantinople. In the early sixth century, he expanded the imperial residence, erected a monumental equestrian statue in front of it and built a grand new basilica, now Santa Polinari Nuovo, to serve as his own palace chapel. To create this large church, he imported a set of capitals and possibly other construction features from the east and some preserved their mason's marks. Um, do you see on the left, mu lambda and here on the right, lambda epsilon, marks which were certainly put on in the, uh, probably in the, sea, uh, in the Proconesian marble quarries in the Sea of Marmara, uh, whence they were sent to Ravenna. The interior of the church was known as the golden heaven and it shines along its full length. Its decoration included depictions of Theodoric's port at Classis and his palace at Ravenna. Palatium. And indeed he probably appeared in the, under the central arch uh, enthroned. These cityscapes were also a rather unusual feature of, of, de of church decoration. But the notion of regal portraiture in a church clearly goes back to Gala Plagidia and her claim of descent from the first, Christ Constantine, uh, first Christian Emperor Constantine. The images of Gothic courtiers standing between the columns were removed by Archbishop Agnellus in the 560s when Justinian instructed the Catholic Archbishop to take over all the Arian churches. Opposite, the scene of the harbor fortifications at Classe now presents a golden wall with the ships at anchor to one side and the fortified port behind. Previously, five figures stood in front of the wall, including the king. While the king had no glamorous ancestry to depict, he made his claim to rule Ravenna and a very large area of the West in a similar fashion by portraying himself in his palace church. He also put his monogram on capitals employed in another church built for the Aryan Goths, which is now destroyed, but the capitals have been rebuilt into the um, um, piazza, uh, the main, main square uh, of Ravenna. 
These Aryan foundations record the domination of the Goths in Ravenna between 493 and 540, marked by the tomb that Theodoric built, which reflects an adaptation of the imperial style of mausoleum that he had witnessed in Constantinople, Thessaloniki, Split, and Rome. This domination was tempered by the Goths' presence as a minority within the Catholic population, which meant that they had to coexist with other religious groups. As a result, Theodoric practiced a much greater tolerance of Catholics and Jews than was found among the Vandals or Visigoths. When the Ravenna synagogues were attacked by Catholic Christians, he insisted that their bishop should assist in rebuilding, in the rebuilding of them. In marked contrast to imperial policy in the East. Let's just see if we do have the, yes, here is the fragment of an amphora with an inscription in Hebrew, um, one of the first uh, discovered in Ravenna. So there was obviously an active Jewish community and Theodoric uh, accepted that they should uh, uh, practice their faith. Although, as he stated in a letter written by Cassiodorus, he could not approve it. I do not approve your faith. I think you've got the wrong faith, but I will not try to force you to disavow your beliefs. No man can be forced to, uh, to believe against his will. And that notion of toleration was to be very much cited in later histories, particularly by the Protestant reformers in the 15th century. Now, I don't know why we've got, uh, yes, here, that's good. this is the slide I want to show you now. Um, this is the, 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 I think it displays the pride that Theodoric uh, retained in his Gothic inheritance and the fact that it uh, was his language that he spoke, that his Gothic supporters and followers spoke, the language that had been devised, the script that had been devised by Rufilus so that they could record uh, the gospels in their own language and then celebrate uh, their Christian faith in their own language. And this, this very deluxe uh, Gothic Bible now in Uppsala um, uh, is clearly one of those um, instances, one of the very few that survives, but very uh, interestingly, more Gothic underscript is being discovered in palimpsested manuscripts uh, now in the archive of the, of the Church of Verona. And these are Gothic uh, commentaries on the Bibles, uh, sermons, fragments of uh, canons from Gothic church councils, uh, Aryan church councils. Um, and these manuscripts were reused later, presumably when people no longer understood the Gothic and couldn't read it. Theodoric also supported the most gifted scholars of his time, praising Boethius for his translations of Greek philosophy and mathematics and philosophy, and asking him to re recommend a water clock that would work and a lyre player and appointing him consul in 520. Boethius delivered a panegyric on the king in 522 and accepted the post of Magister Officiorum. But Theodoric's suspicion that his chief minister was promoting Constantinople's intention to take back control of Ravenna led to his condemnation and murder. The event was closely linked to the restriction of Aryan veneration in the Eastern capital but nothing can excuse Theodoric's treatment of Boethius. The period of closest alliance between Ravenna and Constantinople began with the occupation of the city by troops of Belisarius in May 540. Imperial troops from Constantinople had found the reconquest of Italy from the Goths much tougher than their speedy triumph over the Vandals in North Africa. But by five, uh, July 540, the successful general was able to take the Gothic king, queen, and leading officials back to Constantinople, and thus inaugurated the period of direct rule from the Eastern capital. Gothic, as well as Greek and Latin, continued to be used in Ravenna and can be seen in signatures on papyri. Pretty difficult to read, 
uh, so I've put at the bottom uh, the interpretation, which is uh, uh, included by those who can uh, decipher the Gothic and copy it accurately. The famous church dedicated to San Vitalis has an unusual structure. It's based on an octagonal plan that supports a high dome and has quite exceptional mosaic decoration. It's important to remember that construction began in the reign of Theodoric under Bishop Ecclesius. Here's the church again with its octagonal shape. Ecclesius, had, uh, who held office between 522 and 532, he'd been sent to the imperial capital on an embassy to prevent the threatened closure of Arian churches there. Here he is commemorated as the founder in the apse mosaic. As similar church designs were being used in the imperial capital at the time, it's thought that Ecclesius might have brought the idea of an octagonal base back with him. He was probably inspired by the marble revetment he saw there, for example, in the archiepiscopal throne uh, in, the, uh, in the apse of the church of San Vitale, made of very exquisite inlay, most of it imported uh, from uh, the East. Ecclesius's successors, bishops Orsicinus and Victor, completed the building in about 15 years. Victor imported capitals from the marble quarries at Proconisos in the Sea of Marmara, which bear his monogram, yeah, all round the ambulatory. When the imperial troops entered Ravenna, most of the mosaic decoration of the apse may have been completed with its Old Testament references to Moses, Elijah, Abraham, and Melchizedek. Bishop Victor probably wished to mark the end of the Gothic regime, which signaled the Catholic supremacy in the city, with some recognition of the imperial reconquest. I think it very likely that the imperial panels were installed before Victor's death in 544 and featured himself as the ecclesiastic next to the emperor. His portrait was replaced by the first archbishop of Ravenna, Maximian, who established his position late in 546 and rededicated the church on the 19th of April, 547. Imperial funding may not have been necessary as Julianus, um, the money changer, Argentarios, had contributed a significant sum. And he also assisted both Victor and later Maximian in completing two other churches. It is notable, however, that the Empress was also commemorated within the Vima, the apse area of the church, normally forbidden to women. Imperial support may, however, be implied by the very grand ivory throne preserved in the Archiepiscopal Museum with its monogram of Maximian at the center. Such a large quantity of very expensive elephant tusk might well have come from imperially controlled depots in Constantinople. The Archbishop had very close relations with the emperor. He made several visits to Constantinople from Ravenna and obtained a relic in the form of the beard of St. Andrew, which he snipped off when the, he was invited to admire the relics. As a result of the reconquest of Italy, Constantinople imposed the same imperial control in Ravenna as had been established in North Africa based on Carthage. These two cities became the centers of government run by officials identified by the title of Exarch and thus created the two exarchates that continued in existence for centuries. As appointees of the central government, which was slowly abandoning its use of Latin for Greek, there was an influx of Greek speaking officials who sent their records back to Constantinople, validated by their seals. And you see, for example, here, the seal of, of, of Theodore with the familiar Kyrie Voithe, um, uh, Lord help your servant, and then on the name of the official who is validating his or uh, guaranteeing the authenticity of his document by uh, signing it with a, attaching a seal to it. 
we see the impact of a heightened awareness of Greek in the finely engraved funerary ex, uh, inscription of Exarch Isaac, uh, an Armenian who held office from 625 to 643. It's currently in the church of San Vitale. After his death, his widow Susanna commissioned his epitaph in Greek iambic trimeters and had it inscribed on the lid of a reused um, Christian sarcophagus. It says, he kept Rome and the West safe for the serene sovereigns. Praising his Armenian origin and long tenure of office, it is brilliantly laid out so that it can be read um, either side of the central cross. The Greek can be read either from uh, first one and then the other or reading a cross. This is the old, uh, the late antique uh, sarcophagus used for his tomb. Um, and as I say, the, the lid was uh, a, well, a different lid that was re-employed. Nor is it the only Greek inscription of the period. When Isaac's young nephew died, the exarch ordered a similar record of his life. Bilingual ability must have been quite common. At the highest level of authority, therefore, Greek dominated, though Isaac used Latin to record his patronage of a church in Torcello, and the great majority of the population, including bishops and city councillors, were Latin speakers. Here we see the uh, inscription on the uh, ambo, um, which was commissioned by Bishop, Archbishop Marignan. Ravenna, however, had a school of Greek doctors and another for Latin doctors, where translations of Galen and Hippocrates continued to be taught, as we learn from a student who attended the, uh, the record and uh, recorded the lectures of Dr. Agnellus. Yeah, identified as Iatro Sophista. And Simplicius uh, wrote down what he said. Ravenna was also the foremost center of bilingual education to which the young Venantius Fortunatus was sent to acquire his mastery of poetic meter, grammar and rhetoric, and some knowledge of philosophy and law. After the issue of the Codex, Justinian's new, new laws, novelle, were diffused through Ravenna and are preserved on fragmentary papyri. Sadly, Venantius doesn't name his teachers, but Theodosius, a magister literarum, who witnessed a will in 575, might have been someone who could have provided instruction. The last of the city's surviving early Christian basilicas is Santa Polinare in Classe, near the harbour. And we follow in the steps of many clergy, pilgrims and citizens who walked out to venerate the relics of their first bishop, Apollinaris. Bishop Ecclesius began the building that was continued by Ustinus and dedicated by Maximian in 549. In a magical garden of paradise setting, Apollinaris appears as the first bishop of Ravenna. And under a large jeweled cross with Christ at the center, below the hand of God, with lambs to either side, and Moses and Elijah displayed in the sky. This church became the resting place of most of Ravenna's church leaders, whose tombs line the walls with inscriptions that record their gifts and their lives in Latin. In addition to the four bishops, the previous bishops who are shown in the apse, the, here they are, the four previous bishops. There are two very interesting seventh century additions. Here on the south side is Melchizedek, the high priest, shown in the same scene as at San Vitale. Opposite, there's the commemoration of imperial grants made to Ravenna by the emperors Constans II and Constantine the, the fourth. Here we should notice the portrayal of Archbishop Maurus. He's here with a golden halo indicating that he's now deceased. And his successor, sorry, Reparatos here, who receives from the emperor with covered hand, the form of privilegia, a scroll of privilegia. 
and he receives it from Constantine the fourth. Uh, all the uh, figures are named in the inscriptions above and below. And the panels are obviously modeled on the sixth century ones from San Vitale and use the same borders and patterns in a rich range of colors and decorative shapes. Archbishop Maurus, who held office from about 648 to 71, was a loyal supporter of the imperial theology of monothelitism. He made several visits to Constantinople and received his pallium of office from Emperor Constans II. In contrast, Pope Martin in Rome opposed this official doctrine and in 649 summoned a council to denounce it as heresy. The council's acts were prepared by Maximus the Confessor in Greek, supported by the local Greek monastic communities, and were only later translated into Latin. When he was ordered to attend, Archbishop Maurus refused, claiming that he couldn't leave the city because of Lombard threats. So Ravenna was using both its ecclesiastical and civilian authorities to maintain the monothelite uh, theology. And this inevitably increased the rivalry with Rome. The reuse of imperial representations at Santa Polinaria in Classe presents further evidence of the city's self-conscious sense of its inheritance as a capital city very closely linked to Constantinople. Even after the loss of Constans II's grant of independence from Rome, Archbishop Reparatus made sure that the temporary privilege would be remembered by commissioning a new mosaic. And Reparatus and his successors thus continued to celebrate the liturgy in front of the Emperor Constantine IV, modeled on the Emperor Justinian. In Ravenna, Greek continued to be the medium of many liturgical prayers, such as the antiphons sung in both Greek and Latin, and acclamations of welcome chanted by monks from the four Greek monasteries. It was also used for the exarch's correspondence with Constantinople, and this promoted the career of a young man named Ioannikis, who was appointed to handle the bilingual communication. In addition to translating official documents from Greek uh, into Latin and back, Ioannikis composed such interesting poems that he was summoned to Constantinople where he worked in the great palace for several years. When Emperor Constantine IV decided to end the monothelite theology, he summoned the Sixth Universal Council to meet in 680 to 81. And here I just show you some uh, pictures of how councils uh, were represented in um, Byzantium. Among the large papal delegation that attended this meeting, Theodore, presbyter of the Church of Ravenna, represented its archbishop and was invited to sign the acts of the council immediately after the three papal representatives, the four other patriarchs and two senior metropolitans of Thessaloniki and Cyprus. This very high position in the list of signatories ahead of all the other bishops reflects the importance that Constantinople attached to the See of Ravenna, its major outpost in the West. One intriguing fragmentary papyrus record of the council preserved in Ravenna consists of a list of episcopal signatures in Greek dated 681. It reveals the different scripts used by 36 individual bishops. Some wrote in majuscule, others in a half cursive minuscule, which is widely documented only from the ninth century. Since the sole complete rec record of this session of the council is preserved only in Latin, the, pap the papyrus provides very important witness to, to the event. And it shows the different writing styles adopted by some of the participants. How on earth did it come to Ravenna? My suggestion is that Ioannikis, a talented scribe, might have been interested in the different ways of writing a signature and could have brought it back to the city when he returned in the 690s. A new list, uh, a new edition of the list is now being prepared and it will surely reaffirm the very close relationship between the two cities in the late seventh century. 
Of course, these relations were not always good. A particular moment of extreme enmity occurred towards the end of the seventh and the early eighth century when Justinian II became convinced that the Ravenati had assisted in his mutilation in 695. The emperor was overthrown in a palace coup, humiliated in the Hippodrome by having his nose and tongue slit, and then exiled to the Crimea. From there, he plotted his revenge, and amazing to relate, he achieved his return to power for a second reign from 705 to 711. Agnellus, the local antiquarian and historian of the bishops of Ravenna, records that the emperor wrote, wore a gold prosthetic nose to cover his nostrils, as well as golden ears, claiming that his ears had also been cut, uh, which was another well-established form of mutilation. Justinian was determined to punish Ravenna for its part in his exile and sent a naval force with instructions to capture the archbishop and leading citizens and bring them back to Constantinople. Through cunning ploys, the naval commander succeeded in this class, in this task, and Archbishop Felix, Ioannikis, and the city's leaders were taken into the great palace in Constantinople. For his description of this devastating episode, Agnellus seems to have relied on oral accounts and he recorded, I quote, they found the Emperor Justinian seated on a gold and emerald seat and wearing on his head a, throne, a, a crown which his royal wife had decorated with pearls and gold, like these sorts of crowns. The Emperor's wife, Theodora, may well have decorated a special crown. This is just the sort of thing empresses did and jewels were always a feature of Byzantine crowns. The Ravenati of senatorial rank were then taken away to be killed, and soldiers were instructed to crush Ioannikis between two huge boulders. An, equal, an equally horrible punishment uh, awaited Archbishop Felix, who was forced to stare at a heated silver tray on which bitter vinegar was poured, and in this way he lost his sight. The blinded church leader was then exiled to Kherson in the Crimea. His fate must have appeared as definitive as Ovid's, but not long after, he was saved by a local revolt. An Armenian general, Philippicus, led the rebels to Constantinople and replaced Justinian. They cut off his head and sent it to the west, where it was paraded through the streets of Ravenna to prove that the tyrannical ruler was dead. Whether Archbishop Felix returned to the city at the same time or later, he was the beneficiary of Philippicus's revolt. And until his death, 12 years later, he directed the Church of Ravenna and was commemor commemorated in a fine tomb that document, a fine epitaph that documented his turbulent life. You see here, Domine, Corpus Domine Felicis uh, Sanctissima, Sanctissim, Sanctissim, Sanctissima, et ter beatissima episcopus. I quote from the uh, epitaph that no longer survives. Exile, injuries, hunger, dangers, contempt, banishment, chains, cudgels. He was deprived of his see, lacking sight in his body, divine light arose there. Buried with his whole body and virtue, the bishop was consoled by the highest grace of God and was raised from the heavy prison on the island of Pontus." End quote. After the fall of Ravenna to the Lombards in 751, the city lost its direct associated association with Constantinople. And while its bishop assumed as much power as possible, the Greek monasteries gradually adopted Latin and forgot their traditional acclamations. But the inheritance of Byzantine and Imperial Ravenna was clearly appreciated by Charles, King of the Franks, who visited the city three times and expressed his most obvious debt by adopting the octagonal plan of San Vitale for his palace church at Aachen. He surely stood in front of the mosaic of Justinian in Ravenna and was inspired by its depiction of how to be an emperor. Charles had requested and obtained permission from the bishops of Rome and Ravenna to remove columns, marbles, and capitals from the ruins of early monuments. 
and on his last visit to Ravenna in the spring of 801, after his coronation as emperor of the Romans, he added Theodoric's equestrian statue to his hall of excellent building material. And he set it up in front of his palace in Aachen in exactly the same position as it had, as it had occupied in Ravenna which Theodoric had modeled on his experience of the power of statues in Constantinople. In this way, Charles recreated an element of the ruling city founded by the first Christian emperor in his own new capital, the second Rome, or Roma Futura, as it was called, indicating his determination to set Aachen on the same level as the older cities of Rome. Despite its decline, Ravenna continued to inspire visitors, especially the 10th century Ottonian emperors, who greatly preferred Ravenna to Rome and made the city their Italian base. The Byzantine princess Theophano, who married Otto II, introduced many Greek Orthodox saints to the West, visited Ravenna frequently, and ensured that her children learned Greek as well as Latin. She planned to reinforce the connection with Constantinople by finding a bride for for, from the ruling family for her son, Otto III. But when Princess Zoe eventually arrived in Italy, both Theophano and Otto III were dead. With him died the project to set up a new center for the study of Greek with Gerbert of Oriac, whom Otto had imposed as Pope Sylvester II. Nonetheless, the imperial traditions and respect for Greek learning established in Ravenna lived on in novel interpretations to mold the growth of the medieval West. And much of that inspiration derived from Ravenna, which played such a key role in the transmission of Byzantine culture to the West. Thank you.